So welcome, I, I think all of you know Michael Cohen. Uh, uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen him many, many times on cable TV, maybe you remember Ben Stiller playing him on <laughs> SNL. Uh, Michael uh, was Donald Trump's fixer for 12 years. He was vice president and personal counsel uh, uh, to Donald Trump. Um, as I think you also know, he served uh, about 13 months in prison after pleading guilty uh, on tax evasion and perjury charges. And we're gonna cover a lot today, um, but I wanted to start out by saying something we were not, we're not going to be able to cover, which is the um, Letitia James case. Uh, because our first priority here, I think all, all of our first priorities here is to not do anything that might damage that case or any other case being brought against Donald Trump. And Michael's lawyers have, I think, very prudently advised him to not talk about that case in advance of his own testimony. So we can just uh, understand that at the, at the top. Um, but there are plenty of other cases to talk about. And um, before, we, before we get to them, um, I, and some things about your, your own uh, life and career that I want to talk about. Um, I thought we would start with something that you wrote in the introduction to your book, Disloyal. Um, and I'm, it's, it's a series of characterizations of Trump. And we're going to do a kind of a, start out with a kind of a rapid round where I'm going to say what you called him, and then you give me a quick story that illustrates it. So uh, you start out, you say, he's a cheat. Well, I think it's kind of self-evident to everybody. I mean, there's not a single law firm that he has paid, for example, the legal fees on, which is what's making it so incredibly difficult for him in order to obtain decent legal counsel. He just stiffs the attorneys. Yeah. Every time? Or every, somebody... every time. Every time. But don't they need some cash on the barrel, a retainer, when they start? So a retainer is not the full amount of the expenses right. that would be incurred. It's a fraction. And basically, he'll say, I'm Donald Trump. I don't need to give you a retainer. I'm really rich. And so I'm good for it. And I can't tell you the number of law firms that fell for it <laughs> over the years. Um, it's, it's really tremendous. I do, however, want to say that I am actually friendly with Ben Stiller. I have been for many years. And he felt terrible about uh, the portrayal <laughs> of me uh, while on Saturday Night Live. Just, just, just one, one quick thing on, on the cheat. So normal uh, attorneys now who are getting a retainer because they see what happened to their predecessors, they end up with 10 cents on the dollar at the end of the day? It ranges. Um, some have gotten zero. Others have gotten as much as 50%. So it'll range depending upon okay. uh, each specific instance. All right, next. A mobster. Look, it's, again, it's very simple. When I was using the term mobster, let's also not forget the code to which he speaks and the code to which the Trump Organization uh, follows, and that's the code of omerta, which means silence. Nobody at the Trump Organization wants to speak. And because it is a privately held company, it was impossible for government to understand how things move through the company, to whom things move through, and the process to which, until I decided to come forward, and I decided to expose the entire family for what they really are. Again, cheats, liars, and so on. And that's exactly the basis for um, why the New York Attorney General has been successful in this case, which is um, currently ongoing, as well as the Manhattan District Attorney case. So uh, you told me in the green room that um, the worst thing for Trump's health is when he sees you on television. It's, it's kind of like... <laughs> It's kind of like John, if John Gotti goes outside and he sees Sammy the Bull Gravano walking around. 
Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting thing because my relationship with Donald was incredibly close. As I had wrote, I was the first call that he would make in the morning, 4.35 a.m., we're both awake, and um, the last call before he would go to sleep, which would be somewhere around 11, 11 15 p.m. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't speak with him on a regular basis, multiple times a day. And for Donald to see me on television and basically showing the emperor without his clothes is very difficult for him because he truly believes that everyone owes a duty of loyalty to him. So loyalty is, as I've described it also in the book, it, for Donald it's like First Avenue, it's one way. And he only goes one way, it's never reciprocated. And it kills him when he sees me on. And one of the reasons he doesn't attack me as much as many people think that he would or that he could, it's because the statements that I'm making are truthful. And if he attacks me, all he does is continue to perpetuate the story. Um, you mentioned that he basically gets you know, five hours sleep a night. Um, the White House physician who, and, the, and his other physician you know, said he's the healthiest man I ever met, you know, and then the... Right, and he's 6'3", 215. Right, right. Ronnie, Ronnie, and then Ronnie, uh, what's his name, is now in Congress. Did I tell you that I play for the Knicks? I'm the center. <laughs> this year they have a chance. But, you know, a, a, guy of, a guy at his age who sleeps five hours a night, who eats McDonald's all the time, is there any indication that maybe he... He isn't in good health. Do you know what his blood pressure is or anything like that? So I've never taken his blood pressure. I have unfortunately seen him in his underwear and tidy whities um, I can tell you he is not the healthiest president. I mean, did everybody see Donald sitting there the other day and talking about how he's in better shape than Joe Biden? What's with Joe Biden walking around on the beach without his shirt? Because that's you know, not supposed to happen. You walk around in a suit with a red tie, right? <laughs> For Donald, the whole thing is just, uh, again, it's always a comparison compared to somebody. He clearly looks in the mirror and realizes that he's morbidly obese, that he's not the same body shape as Tom Brady, who happens to be 6'3 and 215, right? The greatest of all time. So when he sees Joe Biden, who rides a bicycle and he rides shotgun in a golf cart, obviously... There's a lot that's going on in the back of this man's mind. Um, all right, next is a liar. <laughs> we'll say that the again. Next, the next uh, word you used to describe him was a liar. So we could be here all day with this one, because I think the Washington Post, you know, they charted... Uh, 35,000 35, lies told yeah, during yeah, the term of his administration. Lies. But if we were, like, going to... I know it's a very tough choice, but if you were going to say what you, you had in your mind when you called him a liar? What, what, were there two or three that you think we should be focusing on more than, than some of the others? I mean, lying about his golf scores is not so relevant. The answer is no. I mean, it's, it would be hard for me to sit here and to point to one specific lie. No, Donald has not had seven holes in one. Uh, I mean, you know, it's... No, you know, he's not self-made. There's so many that I couldn't even come up with the answer as to what it was. It was more of a global fact that everything that he would say, we all knew that it was a lie. But I want everyone to remember, when I worked for Trump, I worked for a guy who was the president and CEO of the Trump Organization, the Trump Corporation, which was a real estate, it was a myopic, a small, family-run real estate development and branding company. He was not the president of the United States, and while I was given the title of personal attorney to the president, that was so that he can keep me around for some of the leftover issues that existed um, as he was going to the White House and wouldn't have to pay me for it. This is what is this is what actually worries me is that is that 
Trump's lies are priced in for the American people. They say, oh, of course he's a liar, but there's so many of them, I can't even think of what they were. All politicians are liars. So the whole thing just kind of And haven't away. we all become just completely numb to that? We've been numbed. I mean, the number of lies. Look, look what George Santos today, for example, it's more. I mean, the, pro, the, the geniusness of Donald is the fact that he takes things that we all know. We know that there are issues with our politicians, but what he does is he goes and he creates a populist view on it so that he can make you despise everyone else except for him. He's always the victim. Have you noticed that? The guy is always the victim in everything. A fraud. What's that? A fraud, that's uh, the next Again, uh, it's rhetorical. Okay. A bully. What's the yeah. w very worst bullying you've seen by him? So, w what's the worst bullying? Um, I want to be clear about something. When people say, oh, you were his fixer. At first, I thought it was a compliment to me and to my tenacity for accomplishing Trump's tasks. And obviously, the longer that it went by, the less I take it as a compliment. I was not Ray Donovan, John Wick, Jason Bourne, running around Manhattan with a baseball bat, skulking around, hitting people, dragging them to Central Park, burying their bodies. That never happened, all right? Was I a bully with a lawsuit? Absolutely, but then again, I was a lawyer, and I was maybe a sharp, elbow lawyer, but who in this audience would turn around and say, you know what, I want to go with that lawyer. He never really wins, but he's a nice guy. I want the lawyer who's going to bring the results. And that's what Donald saw in me going back into 2006 when he asked me to come work for him. I never applied to the Trump org. I was there to collect the fee that he owed me for reviewing a bunch of Chapter 11 reorganization documents. When he turned around, I was at Phillips Nyser, which is a white shoe firm. And I was semi-retired anyway. And for whatever the stupid reason that I decided and accepted the, the job, I regret it every single day. I regret the pain and the suffering and the hardship that this has put my family, my wife, my daughter, my son, and the country through. And I regret it every single day. But, but you... There was something about his bullying that was contagious because it turned, you know, somebody like you into a bully too. And you've apologized for it, for the way you treated people. It wasn't just your ordinary lawyer, you know, using high pressure techniques. And if you listen to some of the tapes of your no, calls no, no, you, no, no. I, what you're referring to is the one tape well, that people have heard because don't I don't to, think don't I don't think that. you'll find more than one tape but where I had a I'm, I'm trying to get moment to of let's just say um, a moment of anger, and I'm sure everybody has had that moment where you just lose your shit on somebody, so, so I, I'm and not, I lost it on him because of the topic. It wasn't about Donald. It was the topic, and the topic was that. Donald had raped Ivana in 1991, and that's just not true. Listen, Donald is many things, but this is not one that was legitimate. And I also had a very deep affection for him and the children, and I know the pain that the six months of New York Post front cover every day caused them. So, so and now there were I, grandchildren, I'm, I'm and I tried desperately to get the guy to stop with the line of questioning considering Ivana, whose English was her fifth language, was simply that Donald had raped me in her deposition. But it wasn't rape in the physical sense, it was in the emotional sense. What the hell she was talking about? I still to this day don't know. But it bothered me, the, the fact that the kids were going to have to read this again in the paper and that the grandchildren were going to be reading it is why I lost it. So, so I, I'm not... Um, I'm not as interested in that, honestly, as I am in the kind of contagiousness of this guy's maliciousness. And, and because that's what has consequences for the country 
and the world is that he makes the people around him their worst selves. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is not, you know, what happened with you in this case or another case, but the way that works, the, his ability to bring out the worst in other people, that's what has the serious fascistic consequences. So I think it's inarguable that Donald Trump is a narcissistic sociopath. And there's something about narcissistic sociopaths that they have the ability to get people to do things that they generally would not do. Why they do it, why I did it, I don't have a great answer to give. Pleasing him was extremely important. Not just to me, it was the culture of the entire Trump organization. It was fealty to Donald. From the second you walked in, to the second you went home, to the time you woke up, to the time that you put your head down to sleep. It was always about fealty to Donald. And it's something, again, I can't fully explain why. People do it for many different reasons. Some, as we see in Washington, are doing it to stay in his good grace, power, the money that it helps to raise uh, for their campaigns. There are many reasons. Some are just plain racists, and they truly appreciate Donald Trump's racial undertones of hatred. Well, that's, that's the next one. A fraud, a bully, a racist. That's the next. What's the most racist thing that you heard him say? Well, one of, I talk about it in the book that I was in the limo with him heading to Trump International in Chicago. We were going through um, a black neighborhood. It was an impoverished neighborhood. And he looks to me, and with the straightest of faces, he says, only the blacks could live that way. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I don't think so. So he goes, no, 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 only the blacks could live this way. Now, I could have gotten into an entire conversation with him about how it's a stupid comment and how it's just not accurate. There are many um, impoverished white um, neighborhoods as well, but there's no point in talking to him or to contradicting him because then you have to contend with the ire. I'll go one step further. He said something once to me, and why I let it go, I, again, I fault myself and my own personal weakness for it. But my father, who's a Holocaust survivor, That's I'm nasty. sitting with um, a gentleman who was the general manager at Trump, uh, Mar-a-Lago, and we're in the middle of a conversation, and Trump stops the entire conversation to turn around to say, you know, I was just thinking, there's a better than likely chance, and he points to the gentleman and says that your family chased Michael's family through the Red Forest. And I looked at him and I said, hey boss, you know that my father's a Holocaust survivor. So he goes, yeah, 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 that's, that's exactly why I asked you. That's why I asked it. He goes, I bet you that your family got chased from his. So I looked at him and I said, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to pick up the shovel and hit him with it? I mean, I, I was, so he was like, no, no, and I felt terrible for the general manager who, if he could climb up his own rectum and die, he would have done it that day. <laughs> it was the most fascinating thing. I felt horrible for him because out of nowhere, this comment just came out of his mouth, much like the other stupid comments that we see every day on a day-to-day -day basis from this ass clown. There's just no other way to describe him. All right, well, we're going to quickly, because we've got some other stuff, but we got two more adjectives. A predator is a lot, obviously, but let's just talk, because you can talk some about the Stormy Daniels uh, case. So you knew that, I mean, in your book, you have this fascinating conversation with him and, and Melania, where you are basically, both of you are lying to Melania about, Stormy Daniels, right? My relationship with Donald had gotten so close that I didn't even need to have him specifically tell me the lie that he wanted in order to actually effectuate the lie that he wanted. And one of them, I was um, heading to Florida with a friend, and I got a call from Donald, and Melania happened to be on the line. 
And it was all about, of course, the payment to Stormy Daniels and the fact I had put out a statement that said, while truthful, it was not truthful in that it didn't tell the part that was accurate. I had stated in, in the statement that Donald, that neither the Trump Corporation or the campaign had reimbursed me. Well, that's a true statement. Um, I didn't, of course, disclose who did pay me back, which you've all seen, I'm sure, the check. So you can see which account that it came from. Do you, do you think, just to cut to the chase on the, because we're running a little short on time, on the Alvin Bragg case, do you think Alvin Bragg will get a conviction? So I stated a long time ago that I think, despite the fact that if you have to tag which one is the most significant case that's currently pending against Donald and which one is the least, this would be the least. I would certainly say seditious conspiracy should be number one, maybe then followed by number two of the theft of top secret documents. Now that there's a possibility it's responsible for what we're seeing currently in Israel, I don't know, I'll be honest, thank you, I don't know um, how or why we even do this, but everything has to receive a number today. And this would be the least, but I wanna, and as I call it on television, this is the Al Capone theory. They didn't get him on murder, extortion, racketeering, prostitution, murder, etc. They got him on tax evasion. And I truly believe that the Alvin Bray case is the easiest case to prove of all of the criminal cases. Remember that the New York AG's case is a civil case. Um, a lot of lawyers aren't sure they agree with that because they, um you know, the indictment was, for instance, they, Alvin Bragg talked about taxes as a way, as an element of the case, but the indictment doesn't really go after him on taxes in, in, in a significant way. Oh, I didn't way. say, I was using the Al Capone yeah, I know, theory. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, um, I mean, that's just a coincidence, but I'm, what I'm saying is that... This specific... You, you think, like, uh, legally, that, it, because you've looked closely at the case, you think that that uh, they're going to have an easier time with jurors on this case. Yeah, so again, I'm the key witness in that case as well. And I can tell you from everything I know about it, he's going to be found guilty. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Um, so you, you can't talk too much about the specifics of what went on inside the Trump organization, but can you paint us a kind of a word picture of the culture of criminality, or the, cu the culture there that is, has gotten them into this trouble, even though it is, as you said, it is a civil case uh, in, in the Letitia James case. You know, they, basically, it became a business that in all likelihood will not be allowed to do business in the state of New York anymore. Well, it's already been determined. Right. Uh, they've already found They're fraud feeling. and yeah. the um, removal of the licenses and good standing are already in play. Now, Judge Angoron did the right thing and they put a hold on that until the rest of the case right. uh, is heard, but there's no doubt in my mind that there will be a liquidation of the assets in order to cover the civil responsibility. Right, okay, all right, well that's, that's good to know. Um, so you taped everything. Uh, you know, which is very good for people who want accountability. Are there other tapes that you might have? You see, that I, I, I got to kind of stop you because this is part of the misinformation, disinformation, malinformation that, and I don't blame you for it. Yeah. I, I don't. Um, I blame Donald and I blame his cast of sycophantic followers. There was one tape, one tape of Donald Trump, and I didn't tape him as a gotcha, I'm thankful that I had it. I taped it because David Pecker, the CEO of AMI, was angry as all hell that he was supposed to get $150,000 back from Karen McDougal, who he paid. I, I was charged with Karen McDougal with paying her. I'm not the one who paid her. AMI National um, Enquirer did, but I still had to plead guilty to it. 
And I'll get to that if I can find enough time. But the craziest part of this whole entire thing, it's one recording, one. And they make it seem as if though, oh, every person that I was in contact with, I recorded. That's just not true. It's an absolute lie. The same when it comes to my taxes. I didn't tax evade. I had an accountant, a CPA. I, I've never in my life been audited Never. I've never filed a late tax return. I've never in my entire Ma life. Mike, I'm well, going to cut, you, I'm gonna cut you off here. What happens is, no, no, the problem yeah. here is that the misinformation doesn't get corrected yeah. with the same ferocity that it comes to you. I've well, never been to Prague. You have other, and you, you were right about that, and a lot of people in my business were wrong on, on Prague. Um, but You're wrong about the tax evasion, too, well, on and the, the HELOC on the, violation, um, and the Karen but McDougal. Just to, to take, I just want to be clear about one thing. What they did, it's important to understand, what the government did, the Southern District of New York, under Trump's administration, what they did is they threatened me on a Friday night, the first time I ever heard from the prosecutors, they threatened me at 5.30 p.m. through my lawyer that if I didn't plead guilty on Monday morning, they're filing an 80-page indictment against my wife. And so I turned around and I said, fuck it. There's not a chance in the world, married her now 29 years, as of the 9th of this month, not a chance in the world I was going to put her through that, that I was going to let them take her out in handcuffs in front of the world. Not a chance. So let me, let me just, in our remaining time, you know him, who he really is, as you mentioned, you talk to him every morning, better than, say, Mary Trump, who's very insightful about him, but you know him much better. Is he scared now? I think scared is an understatement. You know, I think he's absolutely petrified. And I say he's petrified for two reasons. One, the worst thing that you could do to Donald Trump is to take away his money. Because his money is his id, his ego, his super ego, all wrapped up into one. So that's about the worst thing that you could do. And then the threat and fear of potential incarceration on top of the loss of the money, basically making him into a loser, which is a word that is everybody else except for him, that's his biggest fear. And yes, he is absolutely 100% petrified of what's going down right now. So in terms of the money, uh, you write that um, that's why he likes Vladimir Putin so much. What do you mean? Yeah. So he loves the fact that nothing happens in Moscow, nothing happens in Russia without the express authority and consent of Vladimir Putin. And he wants that for himself in this country. He doesn't want to be president of the United States. He wants to be our dictator, our Fuhrer, our supreme leader, our monarch. He wants to be the king. And he won't stop until he actually accomplishes that. And the thing that I, I warn everybody about, anybody who wants to listen, and it sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. Donald himself turned around and said the first thing that he's going to do if he becomes president again is what? He wants to rewrite the Constitution. You imagine this idiot rewriting the Constitution in crayons on the back of stolen right, top secret documents? And what is the purpose of him rewriting the Constitution? It's in order to separate and to get rid of the tripartite system of our government. He wants to remove the legislative branch's power. He wants to remove the judiciary's branch uh, of, of power. And he wants to confer all power onto the executive branch, which is what? Him. And so by doing that, he becomes the king. And there is no one who would be able to stop him at that point in time, because he'll believe that executive privilege, executive orders, will give him the opportunity to do whatever he wants. He can go after members of Congress. He'll go after members of the Supreme Court. He'll go after every billionaire like Mohammed bin Salman did. He will go after everyone who is a critic. I think I'm probably top five. You know, I would like to be a little lower in that list, but I'm pretty sure that I'm top five. And that's the danger of Donald Trump. And it's the danger that I constantly talk about when I say that Trump is the single greatest danger that we are facing right now to the future of American democracy. So even though time has expired, 
I'm going to ask you one more question. You have to answer it really quickly because we're out of time. So what can the people in this room do to stop him? First and foremost, you have to make sure that you register to vote. The number of people that don't vote, it is, it's, a, it's not even that, it should, it should be a crime, especially in light of the situation that we're currently facing. And you have to vote blue. It's just that simple. There is a, there is a wave of insanity going through this country right now on the GOP side that has never been seen before. And it's every single thing that our founding fathers feared going back hundreds of years, that there would be, that there would be a group of people that wanted to take over full control of the government, that it would never come from outside, but that we would destroy ourselves from within. And sadly, they're predicting, their prediction appears to be coming to fruition unless we stop them. And so we must ensure a massive blue, not even a tidal wave, a tsunami that has to just blanket this so that we can end Trumpism, Trump derangement syndrome, this whole MAGA cult. It needs to come to an end, and only we as a collective can do it. I think, thank you. I think people, people don't know, a lot, of, a lot of people still don't know that even though you live in New York, um, which is gonna go Democratic, there are these really terrific call tools you can call into battleground states as much as you want. And basically, uh, this idea of, well, I live in a blue state or I, you know, I can't do anything is uh, no longer true. Any, any person anywhere in the United States can call into other states. They, the people on the other end, I'm told, almost never ask, uh, you know, are you calling from, from our state? Um, and so you can be politically active in the states where it counts. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thank you it. all.